Yes. Let go. Let go. And we are live. Oh man, we've been waiting a, um, a, a minute for this evening, so I'm so excited to be with you all. Um, hi everybody, my name is Chris Rogers. I'm the program director at the Paul Robeson House and Museum. And we are so grateful for you all to join us this evening for another edition of the uh, Radical Black Women series. So I'm gonna toss it to my homie, my comrade, Jamie from Black Women Radicals. Tell us a little bit about the Radical Black Women series and give a shout out to the folks who are watching as well. Yes, hi everyone. Thank y'all so much for joining us and please feel free to share your name, your pronouns and where you're from because we've been waiting for this event for a long time. Super honored and excited to have Z Fung Lu here and just hear about his wonderful scholarship on Claudia Jones, Afro-Asian solidarity and black left feminist visions of peace. So I'm Jamie, like my comrade Chris said, I'm the executive director of Black Women Radicals, I use she, her pronouns. And I'm so honored to be in community and space with the Paul Robeson House and Museum and the Claudia Jones School for Political Education about our collaboration on the Radical Black Women series, which is simply an online political education series and we, where we pay homage to radical black leftist women leaders throughout history. And today we have the honor to hear about Claudia Jones. Uh, you can't get enough of Claudia Jones. So thank y'all so much for being here. And I'm gonna pass it back to my comrade, Chris. Thank you, thank you so much. And we definitely have to give a shout out to the uh, Claudia Jones School for Political Education out of DC. Um, Thankful, thankful for all their support. Dante is will be following us in the chat. And shout out to the whole team there. Lucy Murphy, I see you. Um, so, you know, thanks to the Claudia Jones School for Political Education. We'll make sure that you're aware of their links within the chat. And I want to give a shout out to uh, our new executive director at the house, Ms. Janice Sykes Ross, who's just going to give an opening couple words about the work of the Paul Robeson House and Museum and uh, before we get started with today's proceeding. So Janice. Hi, Chris. Oh, wow. As Chris said, we've been waiting for this day for a long time. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for coming on, all 500 plus of you. So we are so proud to work in partnership with the Black Women Radicals and the Claudia Jones School for Political Education to offer virtual programming that really recovers, explores, and talk about the history and the contributions of radical Black women. So shout out to them. Um, throughout the 20th century, yes, we are the Paul Robeson House and Museum, but as you know, behind every great man, and Paul himself knew that, he was surrounded by great women like his sister, who the house um, that we use as a museum was her house. He was surrounded and had great relationship with trailblazing uh, women throughout his career. And none other than his lifetime partner, his manager, his confidant, and the woman that was by his side 24 seven is Eslanda Good Robeson, who was indeed a black radical woman. And so tonight, we welcome all of you. We appreciate Z Fung. We appreciate you being here and what you're going to bring to us tonight. And Jamie, it's always great to see you. Um, we're inviting the two of you to please come back. The museum is now open. So we're invited you to come and do a face to face with us. To all of you out here, we're letting you know that you can go to our website and find out how to come and visit us when you are in Philadelphia. Um, and we are by appointment. So we're asking that you tour with us, you visit us and always, as always continue to support us. Thank you, Chris, and back to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Janice. And we'll make sure that those links go into the chat so you all can know how to visit us and how to stay in touch. But without, Further ado, I am so happy. Uh, I was just sitting, uh, Zifeng, earlier today with the, uh, the journal on intersectionality and that issue of Claudia Jones. 
Um, so I was, I was reading the work and I'm excited to see, you know, some of those stories be spotlighted tonight, but also the additions that you're going to be adding to the story. So I want to bring, you know, and introduce properly Zifeng Lu, our, our featured speaker for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, his bio. Zifeng Lu is an intellectual historian of the 20th century Africana world with specializations in Black internationalism, anti-colonial thought, and Afro-Asian solidarity. His current project, Redrawing the Balance of Power, Black Left Feminists, Mao's China, and the Making of an Afro-Asian Political Imaginary, explores how Black leftist women's understandings of race, class, gender, sexuality, and empire evolved as they sought Afro-Chinese solidarity within often difficult geopolitical context. His research has been featured in The Economist and CGTN. His essays and reviews in English and Chinese on Black radicalism and African-American political culture have been published in the Journal of Intersectionality, the Journal of African-American History, the Journal of Bihang University. The paper, in Initium Media and in Sina in News. Zifang Lu is currently a doctoral candidate in Africana Studies at Cornell University. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the reins of our talk tonight. Um, for those who are you know, watching us online, please continue to introduce yourself in the chat, name, uh, where you're uh, coming to us from, your pronouns, and let's have a discussion in the chat and we'll have room for questions uh, after the talk. So without further ado, Zifang, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you so much, uh, the Paul Robeson House, Claudia Jones School for Political Education, and Black Women Radicals for this amazing opportunity to be in conversation with you all. And it's um, really uh, amazing to uh, really share some of my new ideas that are you know, very inchoate, very rudimentary, um, and I definitely would love to hear what you think. And to um, start, I really need to, uh, you know, acknowledge um, two people that have been very important to, um, I guess, the stage of my work. So uh, definitely uh, Professor Carly Davis, who is the scholar on Claudia Jones and who uh, is uh, my mentor, who had been my mentor for a couple of years. And, um, and it's really uh, uh, Professor Boyce Davis who actually introduced me to the work of Claudia Jones and uh, who has really been encouraging me to uh, really further explore uh, some of her ideas. And I would also like to acknowledge my friend, uh, my colleague, Nerv uh, Magasbach, who is a peace geographer. So Nerv is the person who uh, kind of encouraged me to really think about peace and how Claudia Jones thought about peace and how her visions of peace can help us better understand what peace actually can mean or should mean in our present moment. So um, I'm pretty sure that uh, audience of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you actually are very familiar with the, the work of Claudia Jones, but uh, to, you know, just briefly offer some uh, kind of uh, uh, context, I'll briefly talk about uh, like the, biography of Claudia Jones. So as you all know, Claudia Jones was born in Trinidad and migrated to the US at the age of eight. So she was a, a leading black woman theoretician in the Communist Party of USA. She um, was uh, targeted, of course, uh, for her political activism, for her uh, communist ideas. And she was imprisoned three times and um, then she was deported to the UK. So uh, according to uh, the work of uh, Carol Boyce Davis, uh, her deportation, or uh, what uh, Boyce Davis actually um, prefers to call her voluntary exile, uh, did not mean the end of her political activism. So in London, Claudia Jones refashioned new ideas. She became more identified with the uh, emerging third world uh, liberation struggles and she became an important figure in um, uh, Black Britain. And she uh, founded one of the uh, first major Black newspapers in London, the uh, 
West Indian Gazette, later renamed the West Indian Gazette and Afro-Asian Caribbean News. And she also founded um, a couple of uh, uh, organizations in the UK and became an important uh, organizer and who actually uh, influenced the uh, future generations of black activists. So what I'm trying to do today is to actually pick up a uh, Caribbean Services call to situate Claudia Jones in um, yet another intellectual activist tradition, that is the uh, peace studies. So uh, the reason why I'm um, really thinking about peace now is uh, first of all, peace is this keyword that just keeps um, recurring, but here and again and again, really uh, in um, the work of Claudia Jones, but also um, I recently uh, was brought to uh, attention regarding uh, really the kind of uh, silence about colonialism and imperialism in current peace studies, or uh, what one scholar would call the racial silence within peace studies. And I think uh, Claudia Jones actually, uh, her work actually could actually tell us uh, how peace should actually always be about anti-colonialism and, and anti-imperialism. So today I will look at uh, the political career of Claudia Jones from the perspective of peace. So I will be looking at primarily two key stages of her career. So one uh, in the early 1950s, so that was uh, the moment of intense McCarthyist uh, political repression, but that was also uh, one of the high point of uh, black black feminism in general. So Claudia Jones, as well as other black feminist thinkers, including Islana Robeson, um, were prolific writers, thinkers, activists at that time, even as they um, to varying degrees suffered political repression uh, due to the political activities. And the second stage uh, that I will be talking about will be uh, Claudia Jones's uh, later experiences in London and her travel to China and Japan. So as you know, the 1950s witnessed uh, the US involvement in uh, the Korean War. And uh, the Korean War was basically this um, key moment um, that witnessed uh, um, the emergence of a women's peace movement. And Claudia Jones uh, articulated her own understanding of peace at that particular moment. So in 1951, Claudia Jones published an important article uh, entitled For the Unity of Women in the Cause of Peace. So uh, I uh, would say that's probably one of the uh, most important articles in um, Claudia Jones's articulation of peace, uh, not only because it's long, but also because uh, it was re really written at the moment when peace was really on everyone's minds. Um, so here, um, I would like to basically uh, summarize some of the ma major points uh, that uh, she offered in that piece. So in this piece, Claudia Jones argues for uh, really uh, a distinct women's peace movement. And here, uh, her project actually is to appeal to uh, members of the Communist Party to further mobilize women of all social and uh, in economic backgrounds, but even uh, that is the purpose of that piece. She argues for the importance of the working class women's leadership. So for her, it is important to unite all sections of women under the leadership of working women. So, uh, so she believes that it uh, is perhaps a sound view of the point that uh, broad masses of women, because of their role as mothers, as the creators of life, are deeply opposed to war and can be won in the majority to peace. Um, they, in a way, have um, a better um, ability to be able to um, uh, struggle for peace. But for her, such a movement must be rooted, first of all, among working class women, Negro and white. So th this is a quote. So for Claudia Jones, uh, it is important to uh, always highlight the uh, centrality of working class women to peace struggles. For her, uh, the, the effects of war uh, most clearly manifested um, on um, the lives of working class women. And um, she also argues uh, that for working class women, 
um, they need to participate in peace movement as uh, women. So uh, here's a longer quote I would like to read and uh, also I invite people to uh, think with me uh, what Claudia Jones uh, wanted to, 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 to mean. So um, women can be aroused to action in their specific roles as mothers and wives who want peace so that their children of today and those yet unborn may grow up to manhood and womanhood. So here it is very uh, clear that Claudia Jones appealed to uh, you know, uh, women's so-called natural roles as mothers and wives, right? So here um, scholars uh, have uh, argued that Claudia Jones is this idea of familialism or maternalism. Right, so scholars of familialism or maternalism argue that um, so for activists who subscribe to these ideas, it is women's natural roles as mothers and as wives that give them this kind of moral um, supremacy, that gives them kind of moral uh, qualification to be able to argue for peace, right? So uh, for people in those, um, I guess, um, in that school, for people with that line of thinking, uh, women are naturally uh, peaceful. Uh, but here, uh, Claudia Jones, even though she does have a kind of a, a maternal uh, understanding of peace, but for her, uh, the reason why women are uh, should be uh, the leaders in peace movement was not because women are naturally peaceful and men are naturally unpeaceful, right? So for her, it is, it is important, first of all, to understand um, the effects of war on women. It is working class women who uh, really um, suffer uh, the brunt of, uh, of war at that moment. It is working class women who uh, had to suffer from um, uh, the death of their sons and husbands. So here, uh, Claudia Jones believed that um, it is um, because that um, um, women, working class women in particular, should be uh, the leaders of peace movement. But also for Claudia Jones, uh, the causes of war is not uh, because, uh, as uh, some uh, maternalist thinkers might argue, uh, because men are just uh, prone to war. It is because uh, war are instruments of the capital accumulation. So in an earlier piece published in 1950, so that was before the Korean War, Claudia Jones argued that um, American capital, monopoly capital could only bring war to uh, the families. Uh, but, and for her, it is important to uh, connect uh, the peace struggles with working class struggles and also to women's struggles. So, uh, here it's very clear that Claudia Jones offers a very capacious definition of the peace that is not just about uh, the cessation of the war, it is also about the elimination of all different kinds of uh, uh, systems of uh, oppression. And uh, so it is very clear that uh, Claudia Jones wanted to uh, connect different uh, seemingly disparate struggles. Um, so Therefore, uh, I think to uh, understand uh, this uh, kind of use of maternalism, it is important to understand that, uh, first of all, Claudia Jones used that strategy to be able to appeal to broad masses of people, and also to understand that um, it is, uh, so her brand of kind of maternal peace politics is not a kind of, uh, is, is not entirely a kind of essentialized understanding of women's natural peacefulness, right? So we have to, um, situate Claudia Jones's understanding, and she did def definitely situate her understanding of peace within a broader anti-imperialist, anti-colonial struggles, and definitely within the broader struggles for socialism. And, uh, but still, to understand um, a Black woman calling for, uh, you know, uh, the well-being of other Black women in particular, it is also important to understand that, uh, um, Historically, um, for black women, motherhood um, was very different. It's still different uh, from uh, white women. So, uh, so, uh, so the right to mother for Claudia Jones has always been a concern. So if you read her earlier piece, um, uh, you will see that Claudia Jones um, 
was always very concerned about the economic exploitation of black women and how that exploitation actually affected black families, right? So um, I guess we can talk about that more in the Q and A. But I do want to kind of complicate this uh, kind of uh, simplistic criticism of Claudia Jones as simply uh, subscribing to this kind of very essentialized understanding of gender. Um, another uh, point of her peace politics in the 1950s was really about her call for a kind of a feminist internationalism, right? So for Claudia Jones, um, the 19, early 1950s witnessed a kind of worldwide identification um, and a global sisterhood of women. So here it's also interesting uh, to uh, see how Claudia Jones uh, tried to connect different um, women's struggles into a united one for peace. So, um, so for, for Claudia Jones, um, the 1950s actually witnessed the, the moment when women, quote, in technically advanced countries learned and experienced during the Second World War, the lot of their sisters in the colonial and imperialist uh, oppressed countries. And uh, that moment was the moment when women in the West should actually begin uh, their responsibilities and also join their sisters in the decolonizing world. So I think this is also interesting because for Claudia Jones, uh, she is not imposing a kind of first world understanding of women's liberation on people uh, in the global, what we might call global South today. And she actually uh, kind of uh, uh, inverse this kind of uh, Hierarchy, uh, on the hierarchy within a kind of uh, conventional global feminism in which women from the first world uh, initiated a feminist thinking, right? So for, for Claudia Jones, women from the West should learn from uh, women who are actually, who are actively engaged in um, uh, anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggles. And then for her, uh, she also understands that uh, there was a hierarchical relationship between women in the first world and women in the decolonizing world, right? So uh, she believes, here's a quote, uh, American women bear a heavy responsibility to the millions of our anti-fascist sisters in the world camp for peace, precisely because the threat to world peace stems from the imperialists of our land. Right, so uh, this is actually a great example of what Elizabeth Armstrong calls solidarity of complicity, right? So women, including Claudia Jones, and actually also including Isana Robeson, they were very conscious of their, the kind of structural inequalities between women in uh, so-called technically advanced countries and the women who are uh, in imperial, in, in, in in countries oppressed by imperialism and colonialism. And um, for them, uh, it is important to recognize that they themselves are complicit in a way in, uh, and, and, and they, uh, and the, the, the very fact that um, they could uh, talk about uh, solidarity uh, should also mean that they should recognize the uh, inequalities between and among women all over the world. So here, I think this is a great um, example to show that Claudia Jones is um, uh, very um, aware of um, some of the uh, problems with the global feminism or transnational feminism that scholars later discovered, right? So in um, this great book, Soldiering for Peace by uh, Soldiering for Freedom by Aaron McDuffie, he believes that Claudia Jones was not very uh, clear about the differences in terms of, uh, 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 I guess, exploitation and oppression among women all over the world. But here, I think when Claudia Jones actually talks about uh, feminist solidarities in the cause for peace, she was actually very aware of all those differences and, and inequalities. And then um, uh, more importantly uh, for Claudia Jones, uh, black women must assume leadership roles in the global struggle for peace. So uh, for her, uh, this is a quote, we must multiply a thousand fold the leadership of Negro women in the fight for peace. Um, so 
she uh, criticized, quote, the white chauvinist hesitation to raise the Negro question in the broad labor and people's peace movement, particularly in the context of America's imperialist aggression against the colored people of Asia. And uh, she also blamed uh, the black reformists and the bourgeois nationalists who, according to her, attempted to sell black people the idea that this was their war uh, and who whipped up jingoistic mood of con contempt among black soldiers for the Korean brothers, right? So here, um, Claudia Jones uh, believed the importance of black women's leadership, but also um, she uh, shows that um, um, there has been hesitation, there has been obstacles to black women assuming leadership roles. But, um, uh, but for, for her, it is also very obvious that black people have always been aware of the connections between uh, the black women struggle in the US. And uh, so in that case, um, uh, 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 the Korean War, right? So um, here it is also important to note that when building international solidarities, Claudia Jones was not just making analogies or comparisons, right? So it's not, she did not say that uh, the, uh, you know, the kind of exploitation and oppression that uh, black women were suffering from uh, were similar to those uh, that uh, people could witness in Korea, right? So, so here she believes that um, uh, black people, uh, quote, see in the bloody massacre of the people of Korea an extension of the foul white supremacy oppression and contempt for the Negro people and the people of all of Asia, right? So for her, uh, it is important that um, um, there definitely was structural connection between um, uh, uh, racism and um, other systems of oppression in the US and uh, American um, imperial uh, aggression. And we can talk about that more as well, uh, but still here, it's, it's still a great example to show that for Claudia Jones, peace, um, uh, should be uh, inclusive of all those uh, important social struggles, right? And, and, and at that moment in the 1950s, so her understanding of peace was not confined to a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of um, secession of war or a kind of, um, uh, the kind of peaceful existence, coexistence that the Soviet Union was trying to preach. Right. So for Claudia Jones, peace became this larger framework in which she talked about other uh, struggles. And I think that's uh, something that uh, we should uh, understand today. But still, if you read uh, her 1951 essay um, about peace, you probably will also notice her references to uh, the Soviet Union. Right. So uh, she believed that uh, the reason why there has been emergent kind of uh, movement um, of solidarity among women for peace was um, in the partially because of uh, uh, women's freedom in Soviet Union, right? So, so, we, so we all know uh, um, what, uh, so there was a kind of uh, element of romanticization in Claudia Jones's uh, depiction of what was going on in the Soviet Union. But um, here, it is also important to notice that when Claudia Jones was, was still uh, in the U US, so she, still, uh, so she, uh, she still had to uh, uh, articulate her ideas in alliance with the, the Communist Party line, which also promoted the Soviet Union, promoted American peaceful coexistence with the Soviet Union, right? So to, to understand that, I think it's important to talk about how uh, Black women, including Claudia Jones's articulations of peace always had to be understood within the larger context of the Cold War, right? So it is not, uh, so we cannot avoid that larger geopolitical context. So um, this is um, her understanding of peace in the 1950s, right? But then as we all know, Claudia Jones was deported or she exiled to uh, uh, London in 1955. And um, then in, 19, in London in 1955, uh, London became this new space for her to refashion herself uh, into a third world uh, activist. So, uh, so the second part uh, of this uh, conversation, I will uh, be focusing on Claudia Jones's um, work uh, uh, in London with regards to China. So 
um, I want to focus on um, Claudia Jones's stance on China's nuclear weapons, right? So in 1964, um, China successfully tested an atomic bomb. The Chinese Communist Party framed this event in ideological terms. Um, so according to the Chinese government, so this successful nuclear test symbolized a new era in China's defense modernization. It was a great blow to US nuclear monopoly and blackmail. It will greatly encourage all peace-loving countries and the people of the world. So Claudia Jones openly endorsed the Chinese nuclear weapons project, and in particular echoed the party state's emphasis on the anti-imperialist implications of the successful explosion. Right, so this, uh, I'm, I'm sure on the surface, uh, seems very uh, controversial or even ironic, right? So for Claudia Jones, who advocated for peace in the 1950s, then uh, became a supporter of China who was engaged in nuclear uh, development, right? But um, then I would like to uh, talk more about how she actually thought about nuclear weapons in China. So she articulated her support for China's nuclear aspirations um, in uh, Renmin Zhibao, which uh, is uh, the mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party. It's a Chinese newspaper. So entering China's directed public sphere, when tightly controlled by centralized propaganda apparatus, Jones expected, was expected to follow the reasoning of Chinese government officials on the significance of the country's nuclear weapons project in order to mobilize Chinese public to forge revolutionary alliances with the third world. Shortly after the explosion, Jones accepted an interview with Jimmy Zhibao and used the newspaper um, as a pivotal venue to forge a revolutionary coalition. She wrote that, quote, China's successful nuclear test for the purpose of self-defense has broken the US nuclear monopoly and was a rebuff to US policy of nuclear blackmail, end quote. She reminded readers of the newspaper of the broad support that Beijing's military modernization drive had gained among revolutionaries in the third world. So, the, so uh, this is a longer quote. The news that China successfully exploded its first atomic bomb has panicked imperialists and reactionaries from around the world but it has heartened the world's people, especially the anti-imperialist peoples in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So to further kind of understand and make sense of her support for Chinese nuclear weapons, it is important to contextualize that support. So it was into the intersecting context of a chi the China-Soviet split of Soviet efforts at peaceful coexistence with US imperialism, of escalating US attacks on the fledgling decolonizing nations and of the reorientation of third world liberation movements toward violent rebellion um, as a new theory of revolutionary violence in the mid 1960s that Jones articulated her impatience with the pace of global decolonization and sympathy with China, China's radical anti-imperialist stance. So by the time of the successful 1964 explosion, clashes over the global nuclear arrangement had dominated Sino-Soviet relations. The post-Stalinist Soviet policy of peaceful coexistence prized rapprochement with the West to stabilize the bipolar relationship over militant anti-imperialist um, internationalism, whereas Beijing oriented its foreign policy toward forcefully supporting third world struggles against imperialism, colonialism, and a capitalism. The USSR expected its third world allies to accept its model for global nuclear order that promoted disarmament and counseled against armed struggles. The extent nuclear uh, monopoly blueprint also promoted by the US, while China sought to become a nuclear power, publicized its successful test as a boon to global decolonization and tried to foment global anti-imperialist revolutions, mirroring the third world's determination to chart a different path to uh, liberation. Put into the vortex of the China-Soviet conflict, 
to and also to maintain her access to China's public sphere to continue forging revolutionary solidarity and to step up her anti-imperialist activism, Jones sided with Beijing. Claudia Jones offered her take on the deepening split in an editorial on the Soviet signing of the partial test ban treaty with the US and the UK in 1963, which for the Chinese leadership once again signaled the Soviet turn to alignment with West imperialism. As Jones reported, the consequences of the agreement aroused in the decolonizing world suspicion that, quote, the main beneficiary of the Moscow Treaty is primarily US imperialism, end quote. She reviewed deliberate loopholes in the treaty, the legalization of underground nuclear tests, the possible spread of um, nuclear weapons to US allies, and the lack of enforcement teeth. Jones therefore chided the USSR for signing the ban that the Soviet Socialist Union, quote, is one of the signatories has unfortunately not switched fears that the partial test ban treaty is not the millennium either as regards to an end of the great threat of nuclear wars or nuclear testing. As Jones pointed out, the signers wanted, quote, on the one hand, to deny the non-nuclear powers, particularly the People's Republic of China, to participate on equal footing. On the other hand, to compel them to affix their signatures to a treaty in which they have no say. But the US state definitely remained the arch enemy and in her writing, Jones repeatedly warned of the haunting specters of US new colonialism, imperialism and nuclear militarism. Her newspaper apprised readers of heightened US imperialist aggression and encroachments in decolonizing nations that threatened to dash their dreams national self-determination. So the examples are uh, Cuba and Congo. So I'll, we have talked about uh, these examples in the Q&A as well. So as these and other unfulfilled emancipatory dreams drove more and more revolutionaries into combat, Jones's newspaper documented a surge of anti-imperialist militancy in the third world. She enthusiastically reported this turn to armed struggle, for instance, in an article on the second conference of heads of states of governments of non-aligned countries that demonstrated, quote, the spectacular development of national democratic movements, end quote, at this conference with, quote, the colonial system of imperialism crumbling rapidly, armed struggle was confirmed as the necessary legitimate means in the fight for national liberation and for safeguarding national independence, end quote which ran counter to the Soviet principle of peaceful coexistence and competition with US imperialists. With those and other articles in her newspaper that highlight the inherent violence of imperialism and capitalism, the intensification of nationalist struggles in the third world, China's militant anti-imperialism and the changing geopolitical landscape, Jones offered historicized justification for the use of force and her support for China's nuclear weapons project, which for her exemplified this counter-hegemonic stance that was gaining solid ground. So for Jones, anti-imperialism was the hallmark of her peace activism. In articulating support for China's nuclear aspirations, she transformed the concept of peace into grounds for solidarity and resistance against imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism. For Jones, the dismantling of imperialism and colonialism was a prerequisite for global peace. She communicated this position perhaps most eloquently in her report on the 10th World Conference Against Hydrogen and atom bombs in Japan in 1964, Jones argued that the struggle for world peace and the decolonization of the third world should go hand in hand, positioned US imperialism as simultaneously intensifying colonial and new colonial oppression and the threat of nuclear war and posited racism, colonialism, imperialism, and militarism as interlinked with each other. In other words, the danger to peace was not nuclear weapons, but, quote, the mercenaries, the US imperialists, who wield them and threaten peace in Southeast Asia and the world, end quote. 
The struggle against imperialism is therefore the struggle for peace. Jones surely vehemently opposed nuclear militarism. Indeed, she protested against French nuclear testing in the Sahara. Concerned with the fallout of the planned explosion in Africa, she charged that the test was a form of imperialism more dangerous and damaging than any form of colonialism. Jones sought to infuse anti-colonial and anti-imperialist politics into global strivings for peace. For her, lasting peace could only be achieved through continued militant efforts to oppose militarism and the deterrent and symbolic power of nuclear weapons would help this fight. As Jones's support for China's nuclear weapons program reflected her faith in the liberatory potentialities of active anti-imperialist struggle, her peace work was not strictly pacifist. While condemning all imperialist wars as unjust, she endorsed the use of force by national liberation movements and saw these anti-imperialist struggles as able to curtail the aggression of US imperialism and thus as a just fight for peace. She then denounced quote, the struggles against independence movements and the peace movements, quote unquote, peace movements, which fail to distinguish just from unjust wars. For Jones, China's nuclear weapons project was part of the just war against imperialism. For Jones, for Beijing could effectively count the US nuclear madness, aid ongoing anti-colonial struggles, and thus advance global peace. Therefore, through formulating a peace politics informed by the Chinese practice of radical internationalism, Jones articulated a decidedly militant anti-imperialist politics. So here, um, it's obvious that uh, Jones still had a kind of romanticized understanding of the Chinese nuclear weapons, right? But I want to show that um, at a certain crucial points, Jones diverged from Beijing's line regarding nuclear weapons. So I would like to still talk about um, the kind of um, uh, hard work, right? Uh, which is also about when she uh, diverged from China, uh, that she had to like the kind of hard work that she had to put into forging transnational solidarities. So I will now further explore how she cautiously navigated the competing visions of Afro-Asian solidarity, and in particular, the rapids of the unfolding Sino-Soviet split, right? So I want to uh, kind of show that even though Claudia Jones um, was supportive of China's nuclear ambitions, but um, she was not uh, uh, in line with uh, kind of the Chinese attack on the so-called Soviet revisionism. Right, so at a certain point, she downplayed the kind of implications of um, the kind of new Soviet leadership and their new ideological reorientation uh, for the global decolonization struggles, right? But still her major, uh, the target of her attack was still US imperialism. So, so this kind of reluctance, right, to review, review the deep rift between uh, China and the USR, uh, and then a kind of a reconciliation effort, right? Um, and then her persistent championing of global anti-imperialist struggle kind of, was kind of through, threaded throughout her uh, writings, right? So, uh, so in uh, to visit, so um, in a travelogue entitled "Visit to the USSR." Uh, she 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 wrote to visit the Soviet Union was a long an ardent desire of mine, for I was curious to see a land which I already knew abhorred racial discrimination to the extent of making it a legal crime and where the equality of all people is a recognized axiom." End quote. Her publicized admiration for the Soviet Union notwithstanding, Carboy Davis discerns that Jones's account of her visit to China seems more energetic. Here, she once again refrained from directly castigating the USSR, even as Jones distanced herself from the Soviet line of peaceful coexistence and competition and stressed the congruence between her internationalist politics and China's militant anti-imperialism in the 1960s. 
Uh, by November 1962, when Jones published uh, the travel log uh, about the USSR, Chinese propaganda was blasting the Soviet revisionists for the betrayal of the communist cause and for capitulating to US imperialism. Escalating Sino-Soviet tensions were thus unlikely to go unnoticed by Jones, but she chose to downplay the implications of the Soviet Union's equivocation about the need to militantly uh, fight US imperialism and support arms national liberation struggles. In visit to the USSR, she offered a selective narrative that avoided mentioning those aspects of the Soviet foreign policy that she did not agree with. This discursive maneuver enabled her not only to encourage revolutionary alliances with the Soviet Union, but more importantly, to transcend the fissures in global struggle against US imperialism in the wake of open hostilities between Beijing and Moscow, thus shaping the geopolitical situation on her own terms. Likewise, Claudia Jones's intellectual production in the pages of her London-based newspaper, the West Indian Gazette and Afro-Asian Caribbean News did not attempt to merely serve China's geopolitical ambitions, even as Jones hailed the country's commitment to radical internationalism, or amount to harsh polemics against the Soviet government, whose doctrine of peaceful decolonization she openly disagreed with. If Claudia Jones's nationalist internationalism established her as a non-aligned revolutionary, her textual operations aimed at Soviet Sino-Soviet rapprochement enabled her to forge ahead with her own priorities in alliance with, but not beholden to the socialist powers um, and with the goal to forge alliances um, across the world split into pro-Soviet and pro-Chinese factions. So to conclude, I really just want to show the kind of uh, evolving understanding of the piece as uh, shown in Claudia Jones's work, right? So in the 1950s, so she argued for uh, a piece uh, during uh, the time of the Korean War, and she articulated a more kind of capacious definition of peace that included the elimination of racism, of colonialism, and um, of um, sexism, right? And um, then, um, but still that kind of peace politics was still similar to uh, the kind of peace politics um, uh, kind of preached by the Soviet Union and the, and, uh, the Communist Party. Uh, and, but um, with her um, voluntary exile, to use the words of Carboy Davis, Claudia Jones um, kind of identified herself more with uh, uh, the, the emerging uh, third world and her uh, peace politics also evolved at the same time, right? But still her support for Chinese nuclear weapons should not be understood as a kind of a, a simply kind of romanticized understanding of the Chinese revolution, but should be understood within the larger global context, which was uh, the Sino-Soviet split, the US, uh, uh, the kind of uh, intensification of US imperialism, right? And uh, to understand those um, often difficult geopolitical context is to appreciate the kind of hard work that Claudia Jones and other people like her had to put into to forge uh, global revolutionary alliances, right? So, um, so that's why I think it's important to recognize Claudia Jones as a, a thinker, of, of a major thinker in the peace, in the radical peace trade tradition. But she not only uh, offered new ideas of peace, but she also herself engaged, actually engaged in geopolitics to try to bring that peace into reality. Thank you very much. Wow, wow. Um, you know, uh, thank you, you know, so much um, in um, bringing so many different threads together. I think it's gonna really make for a robust conversation. And a lot of people in the chat have affirmed that. And as I mentioned uh, before, that we kind of want to continue the conversation for a moment um, and, you know, uh, offer an opportunity for Q&A uh, offer opportunity for ex extending thoughts. And we, we do have a number of, uh, your, you know, comrades and friends, people you lifted up early in our chat, 
uh, here with us as well. So I hopefully want to mix in their comments as well. I know one of the first things that I, um, you know, put into the chat during uh, your talk was the uh, the open access article. You know, decolonization is not a dinner party, um, and I, it's freely available. I, I put it in the chat for folks who are watching to to find. But um, could you just give us a, a little bit more backstory of, of what brings you into, uh, you know, studying so deeply? Claudia Jones and the, and the different archives that you're working through to bring together uh, this research. Thank you. Um, so, so as I uh, mentioned, uh, so I was introduced to the work of Claudia Jones by Professor Carpus Davis. Uh, uh, so I would when so she was in China in 2014, and I was a student. Um, so we met, and she introduced me to um, the work that she had been doing, and I. Uh, uh, later, um, uh, believe that this uh, could be something that um, I could further explore. So, um, and then really, so my my dissertation that I'm currently working on, really the whole research process really started uh, with um, uh, my uh, research uh, on Claudia Jones. So, um, what I really uh, wanted to do um, when I wrote um, that article is try to, first of all, um, understand, um, try to make sense of Claudia Jones's uh, kind of pro-Chinese stance, and also try to uh, be in conversation with uh, other scholars also working on uh, Black internationalism, Black women internationalism in, uh, in particular, right? So one thing that uh, scholars of Black internationalism have recognized is really the contradictions and the complexities of Black internationalism, right? So in the, night, in the mid 20th century, so many activists did not have access to information in the way that we do now, right? So, uh, and they, of course, uh, they also uh, uh, weren't um, aware of the kind of newer theories um, that uh, we are now aware now, but I still believe it's important to recover the kind of work that they wanted to do. Right? So sometimes their ideas might seem idiosyncratic, right? But to use, uh, you know, the, the to, 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 so I really have been inspired by the work of Robin Kelly, who uh, in his book, Freedom and Dreams, right? Encourages us to really even tap the, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, radical potentials of all those seemingly idiosyncratic ideas. But still, I want to show that uh, the, so even as I want to show the kind of uh, uh, complexities of black internationalism, I don't want to uh, try to uh, explore whether the people I study understood the larger geopolitical situations and try to see them as in intervening um, in global politics and mediating different global forces by uh, you know, uh, traveling, by meeting foreign leaders uh, which is the case of Shirley Gomez Du Bois and also Isabella Robson, right? By writing, by uh, you know, uh, shaping the ideas of different reading publics. So uh, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, try to see Claudia Jones as uh, as an activist, but as someone who uh, was really involved in um, kind of redrawing the, the power balances of the uh, post Second World War world. Yes, um, thank you, and I, I I love that your uh, the way of like lifting up the sort of like channels of communication and how so fraught they were at the time, right? Is one of the stories that you lift up is like how like writing of um, about the the horizon of the of the you know Chinese socialist revolution, while not you know in some ways trying to uh, create a, a platform where it's just, uh, you know, uh, critique and talk about the possibilities of how this thing might topple over in China. So like this way of like, I, I, I can only imagine, I think, you know, even today we're sort of struggling through the same thing with our movements of like, what it means to write about and interrogate and talk about the possibilities of, of movements, of political, you know, strategy in public while at the same time recognizing that these things are being surveilled, they're being used to, you know, create, you know, counter attacks and counter insurgencies all, all over the place. And you're still trying to maintain those like 
direct relationships and saying that like, I, I guess we, we, we may differ and diverge on certain points, but it's important that we hold a sort of like a, a critical and principled solidarity if we're able to want to bring about the sort of like socialist or communist horizon that we want to bring about. So I, I would love to, you know, ask a, uh, ask a question. Oh, we got, we had a great question then from Lucy Murphy. I, I'm gonna I'm a save this one and go over to Lucy Murphy's question, right? And Lucy Murphy asks, uh, can you comment on the relationships of China and the Soviet Union to Vietnam during the struggle against the French and the US imperialism, and how that shows up? So uh, that is a great question. Well, um, to answer the question, well, there are a couple of uh, countries involved in that question. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll answer that from the vantage point of China and in this uh, uh, relationship with, with, with other countries. So uh, to answer that question, it's important to think, uh, to, to understand the kind of uh, the, 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 the changes in China's foreign policy uh, from the uh, founding of the PRC in 1949 to uh, at least the early 1970s, right? At least the late 1960s, right? So um, in the 1950s and in, in the 1950s, so China was aligned with the Soviet Union, right? So on several, uh, I, I guess, um, global events, so China sided with the Soviet Union, but the kind of the seeds of the China-Soviet split was already sown in the mid 1950s. But China obviously became really public in the late 1950s, right? And that was also the moment when China decided to kind of distance itself from Soviet Union in pursuing a different, um, I guess, approach to the third world, right? So in the 1960s, the Soviet Union, as I said, stressed on, um, uh, really stressed the importance of uh, peaceful co coexistence. So for the Soviet Union, uh, it was not important to wage um, struggles, right? So, Soviet Union supported the kind of uh, competition between two camps as a way to uh, kind of maintain the Cold War status quo. But China was not uh, interested in that. So, China was uh, uh, deeply committed to radical internationalism, right? So, there was definitely China's own kind of geopolitical considerations. But uh, most China scholars would say that there was at least one, some genuine element. Uh, of this kind of radical internationalism. But then um, in the 19, early 1970s, so China, there was a, a kind of a, a dramatic shift in China's uh, kind of uh, stance on global decolonization, right? So that's why uh, in the era of Ho Chi Minh, so China sided with the, the uh, Vietnamese uh, liberation struggle, but then in the 1970s, Right, so so China under the leadership of uh, Deng Xiaoping, who was very different from Mao, uh, waged a war on Vietnam, right? And and then in the nineteen in the, and from the nineteen seventies on, we see China uh, kind of repeatedly abandoning former revolutionary allies, right? Trying to distance itself from the revolutionary groups all over the world, and we have to understand that kind of. Uh, uh, abandonment of revolutionary groups in the context of China's own uh, kind of um, reform and opening up, right? So China at the time was trying to be part of the global capitalist market, right? And China was trying to, um, to, to be on friendlier terms with the USA. So I think it's important to understand these things to see the kind of uh, dramatic changes in um, this kind of multilateral relationship. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a great um, question from your comrade Nerv. Uh, I'm, Nerv asks, I'm wondering if you encounter any reference or discussion by Claudia Jones on A, peace through armed struggles and decolonization, you know, thinking about Fanon, and B, peace and nonviolence, with the latter uh, a popular concept linked to peace uh, in North America. Uh, that is also drawing from Black liberation and struggles, sort of like MLK. So between Fanon and MLK, where is Claudia Jones within this um, discussion and, and navigating um, both their, um, you know, ways of thinking about uh, violence, peace, um, and imperialism? Sure. So that is a great question. Um, so 
So Claudia Jones actually met MLK in 1963, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, when MLK was visiting London. So she met him. Uh, and um, so, um, and, and um, I think uh, her newspaper also um, reported uh, that meeting. And, um, but I think, um, so this, so my interest in kind of uh, uncovering Claudia Jones's idea about peace and um, struggle was actually uh, influenced by this blog. Actually, um, it's 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 really actually about the call for peace last year. So in the midst of the, all the struggles, right? So when we think about that, we think how peace could become uh, really the the kind of uh, the framework. Uh, that the powers be actually can use to maintain social status quo, right? So a lot of peace scholars actually have talked about that, how peace, how peace actually could be used to just say, you know, let's just keep uh, the social order, which might, how, however unjust the order might be. And I tend to see Claudia Jones's um, understanding of peace through armed struggle as a response to challenging the unequal status quo, the Cold War, or uh, the kind of, uh, colonialism and new colonialism uh, at that time, right? But still, uh, also a lot of peace scholars have argued against the kind of uh, dichotomized understanding of peace and violence, right? So, so, so peace or struggle, so they could actually be situated on a, a, a continuum, right? Not necessarily uh, like, like kind of uh, two, but like very extremely like polarized, uh, like kind of, uh, uh, I guess conceptions, right? So I, I, I guess in that sense, uh, Claudia Jones was trying to challenge the the, the status quo, right? But also, uh, I think to uh, to uh, answer uh, Fanon, to to kind of put Claudia Jones in conversation with Fanon, I think uh, it's, it's also important to understand the context within which Fanon also talked about um, uh, um, struggle. Right, and and then and the context within which Claudia Jones talked about armed struggle, right? So a lot of those moments, um, like the, uh, the 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 Congo crisis, for example, right? Uh, the um, uh, the kind of uh, dashed dreams of a lot of liberation struggles uh, in Africa and in the Caribbean, so definitely informed Claudia Jones' understanding of violence. But still, um, even in her support for Chinese nuclear weapons. Claudia Jones did not say that China should use the weapons. So she believed that the weapons could be a deterrent against um, the Western powers that actually had nuclear weapons, right? So uh, I think there's still a lot of space to think about that. Um, and uh, you know, not just Claudia Jones, but other people like Julius Niu, Ray Ray, Malcolm X, they all applauded you know, Chinese nuclear weapon success, right? Muted. Yes, uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, also adding, you know, uh, uh, Julius Na Naire and uh, Malcolm X to the conversation today. Another, you know, I think one of the, uh, you know, uh, discussions that were that was happening in the chat. First, I give a shout out to uh, uh, Julian. Says uh, thank you, Zifeng. Long live, long live revolutionary Black Chinese solidarity, right? And I think you know, in particular. To this year, there's been a, a, a renewed call for, you know, Afro-Asian solidarity, or and I I, I want to be specific, right, about Afro-Chinese solidarity, and think about um, it's kind of kind of two a, a two-part question, and one maybe like a more academic center question in terms of, in terms of the uh, sort of like archive of you know revolutionary Black Chinese solidarity, where can people look and and, and find and, and read. Um, historical examples of, 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 of this in action, what uh, models, I mean, you know, I, I give a shout out to Paul Robeson, uh, Islan Robeson as well, but what, what, where, where can people look, what resources should they look to find to recover this, uh, you know, um, point of solidarity between these two communities and shared struggle? Absolutely. So uh, there have been um, books and there are new books about the subject. So, um, just to uh, you know, to to acquaint ourselves with the uh, some of the uh, like uh, scholarship, right? I would recommend uh, uh, um, Taj uh, uh, Taj uh, Fraser's uh, book. It's called "This Is Black," 
So that book is a, is a great examination of some of the uh, media forms that were used to forge kind of African-American Chinese solidarity, right? And then uh, scholars like Jared Horn, who is, as we know, very, very prolific. So even though he has not written a book about China, but many of the people uh, on whom he has written books uh, have connections, had connections with China, and he actually did uncover some of those connections, uh, in particular, Shirley Gormit Du Bois. And uh, then um, if you are more interested in uh, the kind of um, archival sources, so I would say, um, so one of the best uh, place to, um, to, to do this kind of research, or even just to uh, find out what actually happened will be uh, the papers of the, um, Robert F. Williams. Uh, because as we know, he was in China for five, six years during the Cultural Revolution actually. But uh, uh, well, in China, uh, there were uh, there are still documents about his travels to China in 1963 and 1964 because uh, archival sources post 1966 are not available in China at all. But you could probably find something uh, that uh, could indicate uh, the experiences of uh, uh, Robert F. Williams in China in his own papers um, that are um, at uh, University of Michigan and other, and then. Um, there are also a lot of cultural products. For example, um, since this is the Paul Robeson house. I, I wonder, uh, I'm sure people probably know about that, that the song that Paul Robeson did in collaboration with uh, Liu Liangmu, who uh, was a, a Chinese person in the US at the time. They collaborated on the song called March of the Volunteers. Uh, the Chinese title is called Xi Lai, means rise up. So the March of Volunteers was originally a song uh, used to uh, uh, like used during the Chinese struggle against the Japanese in the 19, uh, which, which was actually China's Second World War. And that song late, later became the national anthem um, of China. And, uh, and that the, 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 the version that uh, was sang, sung by Paul Robson is actually available on YouTube. Uh, and uh, probably you will be able to find the, the, the some like the vinyl record somewhere. Um, and then um, uh, the Black Panther Party, for, for example, so their, their newspaper, uh, the, the Black Panther Party also uh, has a lot of information about their connection with China and other parts of Asia. Um, yeah, I would say like there has been a lot of, there that definitely has been a strong presence of China within black radical circles, right? Even in the 1970s, when China was turning to the right, uh, China was still uh, hosted a lot of uh, black act activists to visit China. So many, many people went to China in the 70s and 80s uh, um, and uh, they uh, wrote about their trips sometimes. Some, some of them did, some of them did not. But I would say um, these are maybe the kind of archival sources um, where we could explore more about that history. Yeah, and um, I definitely want to give a shout out to AB who's been in our chat listing up um, in terms of like the black leftist sort of like uh, political praxis in this moment. And we recognize, and I mean, I think it's, it's kind of, you know, present, um, there was a lot made about the way that uh, uh, the former President Trump sort of, you know, pitched uh, America to China. But in terms of continuations, we see the same um, sort of uh, myths um, pervade this uh, uh, administration as, as well. And kind of thinking of how that sort of like anti-Chinese uh, uh, rhetoric and the, the ways in which, you know, um, anti-Asian, um, you know, myths kind of continue within our both political discourse, but also in terms of our opportunities to grow true, you know, transnational solidarity. Um, I would love to hear you talk about like, what does that practice look like, right? In terms of, 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 of living a sort of like a, a, a revolutionary Black Chinese solidarity. What are, what are the, uh, you know, practices that um, we need to take up in our movements and how do we, you know, uh, recover those lessons and, and take those strategies in, into the streets, right? What are the different sort of like movement moments or, or particular opportunities that are out there that can bring our communities together to talk about 
whether it's on a you know uh, an economic level or or, or something like that. Uh, what are what are the opportunities today for Afro Asian struggle, Afro Chinese struggle to be specific, but lifting up what are what are the movements that we need today? Absolutely, Th this is a great question. Um, so I've actually uh, given some thought to this question, but these are also very inchoate ideas. So I do think um, there's a lot to learn from the um, the thinkers that who actually thought about the same question, right? So um, if we look at the work by people like W. B. Du Bois, by Paul Robeson, by Claudia Jones, and by Vicky Garvin, um, so so they talked about China's relations, China-Africa relations, and you know, China's engagement with the decolonizing world. And for them, um, like it is always important to elevate issues of race, class, gender, and empire, right? So how can we reframe China-US relations by centering you know, racial justice, by centering you know, uh, kind of uh, anti, um, kind of sexist, anti-racist uh, struggles, right? Because uh, the thing is, before Nixon's visit to China in 1972, China-U.S. relations were actually about anti-racist struggles, right? Because uh, be be before that vis visit, uh, Americans were not allowed to visit China. And um, a lot of Black radicals visited China, they were actually the major people who uh, visited China and also other of uh, uh, ra radical activists, right? So they came to China as a way to um, learn more about the Chinese Chinese Revolution, as as a way to forge a kind of bridge between revolutionary peoples, not necessarily for the governments, right? So I think that's something that we can think about, right? So it, it's not to say that we should go back to that time, but to think about how we can um, understand international relations from that perspective. Um, and um, I think uh, I'm still thinking about this question as well, but um, if uh, our members of the audience uh, think this is also worth considering, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to be in conversation in the future. For sure, for sure. And, you know, um, I think this is, this reminds us that, you know, everything that we do as a, in, in this partnership, you know, the Paul Rooks House Museum, uh, Black Women Radicals, as well as the Collier Jones School of Political uh, for political education, it just opens new opportunities, right? And we have these, this uh, possibility for new conversations to take place, new gatherings, new assemblies um, to continue this work, both in person and online and continue to build this uh, community, right? To, to uh, reach for a world that we deserve. Um, so we are uh, like coming to a close here um, this afternoon. I wanted, you know, give you a, a opportunity to home for any final any final thoughts if you want to lift up what's happening next out of what part of your dissertation are you at right now is um, in just finalizing this project what's next sure um so so my dissertation looks at a group of uh, uh, black women radicals so uh, I do have uh, some work on Zana Robson and I'm actually currently writing that chapter about Zana Robson uh, so Isana Robson, so she actually visited China in right after the founding of the PRC. Uh, she, along with the Ada Jackson, who actually uh, used to live uh, in Brooklyn right here. So I'm in Brooklyn, so she used to live not far from me. Um, so they were the first two African-American African women to visit China in 1949. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, uh, kind of sketch uh, the kind of different yet um, intersecting trajectories of uh, black feminist engagement with China. And one thing that um, I think it's in interesting to note is that uh, even um, they, like it's for my dissertation, so they, they're gonna be in conversation with each other, but they also deferred uh, with, from each other sometimes significantly. So, um, Shirley Gorman Du Bois, um, as we know, um, so like she she was a uh, resident in Ghana until the fall of Kwame Nkrumah in 1966. And after that, she moved to, uh, she was in Egypt a lot, but she was also in China a lot, right? So in the 
1960s. Um, so uh, Shirley Gorin Du Bois actually uh, uh, criticized Isana Robson around the issue of China Soviet split, right? So I think that's something that I will continue to explore, which really shows the kind of uh, uh, the kind of implications even for their personal relationships uh, about uh, of the kind of uh, complex and messy geopolitical situations, right? And, and then with all those different competing visions of Afro-Asian solidarity and how did they understand India? How did they understand the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of um, struggles, the kind of differences within the third world, right? Or what we might call the third world, so I think these are some of the things that we need to understand. But still, I think uh, what I'm trying to show is that um, it is difficult to forge international solidarities. And, um, but uh, the people that I study understood the difficulty and they tried uh, with uh, mixed results, but they tried valiantly. And I think um, the fact that they tried and the things that they articulated and formulated in the processes I think are definitely something we should continue to learn from. Yes, yes, and I, I, I love the, the story of, 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 um, of dis uh, disagreement and finding different positions around issues and, and thinking particularly of, you know, our trailblazers and people who really like, um, like led with that level of complexity that we recognize as present in our political landscape today has always been present. So how do we bring that same richness in the way that we tell stories of these individuals? Um, so I'm really excited to read more uh, of this project. And I know you have uh, uh, a lot more work ahead. Um, I want to say, you know, thank you all, the many who have joined us online. Uh, this, you know, conversation will be saved um, and, and, and made available. And we look forward to, you know, continued dialogue and continued opportunities. Um, so, I, I mean, for me, I, and I'll say this for, you know, Jamie at Black Women Radicals and the team at uh, 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 Claudia Jones, at the Claudia Jones School of Political Education, thank you so much for this talk today. And um, yeah, this is another great addition to the Radical Black Women series. Um, so we do have a, a, another event coming up soon. We'll launch that out to the public. And Zifeng, just thank you so much. Thank you. And, thank you so uh, much. I want everybody to have a great evening, and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye. See ya.